I'm Alice Fault Trades, and this is the Sunday Book Circle for In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. In the Dream House is a memoir about the abusive relationship Machado used to have with another woman. It covers the relationship from meeting to their breakup and Machado's ongoing recovery. The book focuses on examples of queer abuse in both literature and real life, and to some extent, abuse itself. I'm not very fond of memoirs. I find most of them to be overly poetic about mundane subjects, wherein the author tries earnestly to make their life seem worth writing about, partly because I think they are struggling internally with the idea that their life isn't worth writing about. About six months ago, I tried to read Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls and How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, and they were both so uninteresting to me that I was getting behind in my other readings. I decided to scrap reading them because of this. I tend to finish every book I start reading. Now, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel is about important subjects, but Alexander Chi does seem to be overcompensating with his prose at times. One with the tribe of fatherless girls was just annoying. Madden kept trying to garner sympathy for not being popular as a child, and I could maybe get behind that, having also not been popular. But when I was barked at, called she-male, or fake-assed out dozens of times in a single day, I couldn't then go ride one of my many horses to get over the pain, as I didn't own one horse, let alone several. It was the point when she said she went to a private school the first one in the country to give all their students laptops that they all took for granted and tried to destroy, but at the same time tried to make me feel bad for her that her one friend didn't want to be seen with her, that I was done. Being made fun of in school sucks, granted, but I cannot feel much sympathy for her when she is clearly growing up with a silver spoon in her mouth. We're about the same age, and I didn't get my first laptop until I went to college. A community college, by the way. I don't know what point she was trying to make, but maybe to someone who grew up with money or who grew up with lots of friends, sympathy could be gained. But I just couldn't stomach her constant attempts at my pity. She said in an interview that she wanted people to feel the power of being an outsider. Been there, done that, while poor. My overall point, though, is that generally, I'm not a fan of memoirs. When one of my book clubs chose Becoming by Michelle Obama for their next book, I yeeted out of that chance because there was no way I was ever going to read that book. So why did I even give In the Dream House a chance? Well, for one thing, it's short. Also, and this greatly impacted my ability to read it, Machado broke up the memoir into such small pieces, allowing the reader a break whenever the prose may have gotten a little too poetic. And even more importantly, In the Dream House has what I consider to be one of the most important subjects, interpersonal abuse. I've read a lot of books on psychology. I also read a lot of accounts of people both dealing with mental illness themselves and having a loved one with a mental illness. I'm no expert and not a therapist by any stretch of the imagination, but while I said that Alicia in The Silent Patient was not borderline, it's absolutely clear to me that the woman in the dream house suffers from borderline personality disorder. She is outgoing and charming to the point that too many people who have met her do not believe that she could have been abusive. While she could have been lying when she said her therapist didn't think there was anything wrong with her, this does happen with BPD sufferers. They can put up a good front of being likable and undisturbed. She also disassociates in times of stress and both pushes away and clings to those people in her life. While some mental health professionals think that only women can suffer from BPD, this has been disproven many times. And regardless of gender, BPD sufferers have a high rate of becoming abusive and prejudiced, and they often see hostility where there is none. This may shock some viewers, but I feel sorry for the woman in the dream house. I don't think any past trauma or current suffering excuses abusive behavior, but it is clear that a person has to be in a tremendous amount of pain to want to hurt someone they love. A lot of people believe that abusive people are evil and will never change. Neither is true. Abusive people are mentally ill and with good treatment can get better. They must acknowledge that they are ill and dedicate themselves to getting better. And that's difficult to do. The U.S. isn't the greatest place to be mentally ill. 
We have a stigma against any kind of mental health issue, and it's hard to find good treatment at an affordable price, even if we work up the courage to seek treatment. An added problem for BPD sufferers is that once they have a diagnosis, which they are often misdiagnosed as having a mood disorder of some kind, is that many mental health professionals refuse to treat them because they can be very draining on the professional who tries to treat them. BPD sufferers can be either sex, can be queer or straight, have male or female partners, can be monogamous or non-monogamous, and come from any racial, cultural, or economic background. And that's the part of In the Dream House that irks me a bit. Well, in the beginning, Machado makes the point of saying that male abuse victims exist and have always existed, and stated throughout the book that equating abusive behavior with men only created the issue of erasure for queer female victims, she still kept equating abusive behavior with maleness. At one point, close to after her and the woman broke up, she was going to spend time with a man. He asked her to do a few things she didn't want to do, but she said yes to all of them. She stated that this man's maleness has as much pull as a carefully curated long-term abusive relationship, and that's bullshit. I wouldn't say that his maleness has anything to do with her urge to say yes, to be accommodating. Instead, abuse victims are trained to be accommodating by their abusers. They feel that saying no to requests will cause an abusive episode, so any request becomes an implicit demand with the threat of punishment for not complying and performing the task adequately. She also implies later that men have been successfully getting away with being abusive, that it is even expected for them to be abusive, especially if they are successfully creative to the women in their lives. Interpersonal abuse is illegal in the U.S. Like many crimes, it is hard to convict. But we can't ignore the fact that it is illegal. Narratives about abuse almost always cover the traditional heterosexual male abuser and heterosexual female victim, so it's not like we don't acknowledge it exists and is wrong. She brings up the invisibility of queer abuse so often, but far too often feeds into the narrative that male victims of female abusers don't exist. You want to talk about invisible? That's invisible. I'm not going to say that focusing on her specific abuse, i.e. queer abuse, isn't important. It absolutely is. But I just wish she'd been more careful of doing the very same thing she seemed to be fighting against. Erasure of victims because they don't fit a preconceived picture. There is this incredibly stupid and erroneous idea that interpersonal abuse is about physical power. This isn't true. Because all abuse isn't physical in nature. Abusive relationships don't pop up like weasels wherein a seemingly happy person just starts punching their lover. They grow like weeds. And they may never become physical. So the question is, what is abuse? It is about power. Power in abusive relationships is not based on physical metrics, but emotional ones. Abuse starts with the verbal breaking down of the victim's sense of identity and agency, making them feel powerless, hopeless, and deserving of any pain or punishment their abuser doles out. This means anyone can abuse anyone else regardless of comparative physical strength. I've heard people argue that abuse victims don't leave because they are physically weaker than their abusers, but that's not why they don't leave. That wouldn't make any sense since victims are not with their abusers 24-7 under normal conditions. Why do they stay? They stay because their abuser has made making and maintaining friendships too hard. They believe no one else will love them. They don't know how to extricate their life from their abusers because of shared finances, homes, etc. They're embarrassed by what people may say. They believe this is what they deserve, and so on, and so on. Abusers create this sense of feeling trapped without consciously doing so. All toxic relationships are about a pattern that reinforces itself over and over again. Realizing the pattern is bad is one thing. Breaking it is another thing altogether and so much harder. A perfect example of a male abuse victim and female abuser is Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Had the names on the audio transcript been reversed, there would have been no doubt in anyone's mind who the abuser was. There is no doubt in my mind from reading that transcript because based on what they both said, Depp would leave because of fear of escalation, even if vacating was only temporary, something abuse victims do often and are told to do. But Heard doesn't want him to use this tactic 
because then she can't continue to take her anger out on him. Her behavior post-divorce is also classic of abusers, especially female abusers, who attempt a smear campaign against their victims. To those that defend her by bringing up her good works, let it be known that abusers are not mustache-twirling villains. They are complex human beings and often capable of great, sincere empathy, which is another reason why victims often stay with their abusers. That complexity is confusing, especially in the wake of the work an abuser does to tie their victim to them. I'm not saying Heard is the abuser as a person who doesn't believe women every time they say they are abused, but as someone who has become close to people of either gender who have suffered abuse. Acknowledging male victims of female perpetrators does not invalidate female victims of male perpetrators. Abuse isn't all that tricky to understand and recognize when the evidence is put in front of you, but it is tricky to get the classic narrative of abuse out of your head. The societal response to male victims of female perpetrators is the same response that societies that don't believe female victims have. You must have done something to provoke this. The classic narrative of abuse is something that Machado is fighting against, and I applaud her for it. Focusing on the experience of female same-sex abuse is still important, and it made sense for her, as a lesbian, to focus on that. We must stop associating assault and abuse with maleness. Women will never be equal to men in society if we are not also considered equally capable of unethical and toxic behavior. By placing us entirely into the victim pigeonhole, society infantilizes us. In many issues of gender, we are not held to account even when we ask to be, such as our ability to decide how many children we want to have. And while that's bad enough, it's worse in the fact that it erases and invalidates victims of female wrongdoing. Now, a lot of people will disagree with me. They will say that by promoting our capacity for wrongdoing, that I am eroding the public trust of female victims. But I say that figuring out who the perpetrator is and who the victim is are not as hard as this may suggest, but it's certainly not as easy as doing a genital check. That is a reductive and irrational way of looking at the world. Not to mention sexist. The world is not a video game with easily marked enemies recognizable simply by looking at them. That is prejudice. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being treated like a child. But that is something that Machado inadvertently brings up. While she points out that female same-sex relationships are treated differently by the courts, it shows how the courts change how they consider women's actions if a man is involved. I'm not saying that victims who kill their abuser should be charged to the full extent of the law, but that the sexes of the people involved shouldn't have any bearing on how we see and judge the abuse. On less heavy topics, which of course I had to talk about because In the Dream House brings them up, I very much liked the prose and style of this book. I know I went off on overly poetic prose of memoirs in general, but it works here. Machado has mastered her craft and knows exactly what she's doing. I mean, I had to have her read it to me on audiobook because sometimes the subject was too painful and it might have taken me too long to read it otherwise. But Machado and I are close in age, so a lot of her pop culture references really allowed me to connect to her in a much fuller way than if she had left those out. For example, I've seen the Five Lights episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, and it does really stick out compared to other episodes. It is painful to watch, and while I've only seen it once, I've never forgotten it. I will probably also never forget In the Dream House, because while it is also painful to read, I connected to it very viscerally, which is part of why it got me so fired up and thinking so much. That's a good thing. The prevalent use of the second person was incredibly important in letting the reader know that this could happen to them too. John and her uncle Nick were amazing, shining lights of humanity that were desperately needed. It's clear that John knew on some level what was going on by his frequent head shakes and the response to Machado crying after falling through the bookcase, and that he cared about her, just as a person. Her Uncle Nick's immediate desire to comfort Machado in the wake of her confession, blowing right past the point that she was a lesbian to the fact that she was in pain, was so wonderful. I do know plenty of Republicans who don't give two shits about sexual orientation, so this made sense to me. 
I also appreciated that Machado, for the most part, didn't shy away from the female experience of sex. The one time she did, when she had sex with her ex-boyfriend, who also did the great thing of just listening to her story, something abuse victims sorely need, I was so confused by the semen in her hair. What were they doing that caused that? I could tell you my graphic thoughts on that, but I'll spare you. Just know that I was very distracted by not knowing what exactly led to his semen being in her hair. Despite any issues I may have with In the Dream House, I strongly recommend it. It is one of the most important stories I've ever read. It's eye-opening to those who believe all women are perfect and calls into question, as Machado purposely does, the narrative that female same-sex relationships are somehow above the issues of all other relationships. I started recommending this book to people before I finished it. That's how important I think it is. Don't get me wrong, I don't believe it is perfect. But despite that, it is pivotal. I believe it gives such a clear view of the abusive relationship, especially what goes on in the victim's mind. But what did you think of In the Dream House? Did you love it? Hate it? What part of the book stuck out to you the most? Was this as difficult for you to read as it was for me? Did you find Machado's prose enjoyable? And please, if you are currently being abused, which I know abuse instances have gone up since the lockdowns, know that your local shelters and police are still a resource for you. Please call or visit the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Please feel free to share your story here and be respectful of others. Remember that these victims are our family, friends, and co-workers. I will be watching the comments on this video closely to ensure that if a dialogue does get started, that we stay empathetic. Oh, and happy Mother's Day. Would you like to see what I'm currently reading? Follow me on goodreads.com slash outsfalltrades to see what I'm reading right now and what book reviews you can expect in the future. I've made a Discord. I'm on it all the time and you're all invited to chat with me. There are channels for video games, movies, TV shows, books, and writing. Even a place for you to promote your own things. Join me there. Everyone is welcome. Merch, 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 merch. Yeah. Check out my new shop at cafepress.com slash Alex for all kinds of products with my face on them.